Hello everyone, today in series of Docplex Scale interviews, we have with us Dr. K. Sarat Chandra. He is currently the President of Cardiological Society of India. He has been the editor in Indian Heart Journal from 2012 to 2014 and he is currently working in Hyderabad. Thank you so much doctor for this interview. So let's begin with the first question. Uh, how common uh, is it to find uh, in Indian patients a uh, high risk of group with comorbidities? Well, one can say it's difficult to find a patient who does not have multiple comorbidities. Such is the status of uh, our population today. You encounter uh, among uh, your uh, patients, those who have diabetes, hypertension, obesity, uh, abdominal obesity, abnormal lipid profile. If all these things are not there, then he is a smoker. So comorbidities have just become the order of the day and we are all very concerned and worried about uh, the number of uh, patients we see, relatively younger patients, more and more uh, you know, younger patients we see. Uh, if you may allow me to say, tell you the truth, last two months I have seen at least six patients who had heart attack less than 30 years of age, believe me. Less than 30 years of age, uh, myocardial infarction is such a um, you know, a rarity in the past, today the disease has become painfully common and uh, comorbidities have become the order of the day and uh, serum creatinine levels also which we know is an important uh, comorbidity suggestive of uh, renal disease has become extremely common. Uh, these are all experiences from seeing a large number of patients and uh, um, I can tell you uh, one in two patients has multiple comorbidities. Uh, so diabetes, hypertension, smoking of course is uh, always a very big issue in younger patients and then abdominal obesity and so on. So uh, we are always uh, um, finding it a challenge to find a person who does not have comorbidities, to put it like that. Right. Uh, so doctor, moving on to the next question. How important is immediate primary PCI in patients with STEMI complicated by out-of-hospital cardiac arrest? Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, it is important to do primary PCI in every patient with STEMI. Uh, and in a patient who had an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, it becomes even more important. And uh, we know primary PCI, um, the old adage we know that uh, time is muscle and muscle is life. So every patient of myocardial infarction, you would like to do uh, primary angioplasty at the earliest. And in a patient who has been brought to the hospital after a brief cardiac arrest and has been resuscitated either by family members or bystanders and so on, uh, in them the risk of uh, another cardiac arrest is even higher. Uh, therefore, uh, it is extremely important to take them up very quickly. But then, uh, you know, there are challenges of uh, mobilizing the patient, challenges of do some brief investigations for the patient and uh, most importantly in India, the biggest challenge is to find a cath lab which is free at that point of time. Because many hospitals work with a single cath lab and with the number of patients today uh, who, um, who are flogging to the um, hospitals, it's not easy to find a cath lab where the lab is free for him. So that's, that's a big challenge. A lot of time is lost in mobilizing the personnel and the uh, cath lab. Okay. Uh, so, doctor, my next question is, what are the major adverse outcomes after coronary intervention in diabetic population? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, it was always relevant. Today, uh, one must quickly say that the stent thrombosis, which was a big challenge in all patients who underwent PCI, particularly in diabetics. We know diabetics suffer from stent thrombosis, a higher uh, risk, there is a higher risk among diabetics compared to non-diabetics. Fortunately today, you have very powerful antiplatelet agents, prasugrel and ticagrel hormone, which are now of course available in Indian market for many years, very powerful antiplatelet agents and uh, the stent thrombosis, uh, we have to accept as become a, an uncommon thing, has become an uncommon thing unless the technique is not up to the mark if you and even the our understanding of how to do angioplasty also has improved a lot 
and uh, with the current understanding that you need to give a high pressure dilatation following stent implantation and give these uh, adequate doses of these drugs in a, at a, uh, quickly. Uh, so, the stent thrombosis in my experience has come down and I am sure other interventional cardiologists uh, will watch to this fact. The stent thrombosis has uh, really come down. The uh, real challenge, another challenge is restenosis. Uh, so, uh, you, you may not be saying that it is an immediate complication, but restenosis is an important uh, um, point of uh, concern for us and uh, compared to non-diabetics, diabetics are more prone for restenosis. Once again, with the advent of uh, very advanced stents, particularly with the Avrolimus saluting stents and uh, stents with thinner and thinner um, uh, stent struts, the chances of restenosis also have come down to a certain extent. In fact, in my practice, I am talking about it in a purely personal way. In my practice, if a patient comes to me with recurrence of symptoms after angioplasty, today more often than not it is due to the development of a new lesion, not so much due to uh, stent restenosis or stent uh, occlusion. So the biggest challenge in these patients is to tell them to follow all the um, guideline based therapy take all the medicines, keep your regular follow up, keep your uh, uh, blood pressure low. I will tell you a very good uh, trial that has come in the uh, recent past at European Society of Cardiology meeting. It was presented, <coughs> it is called the SN trial, where they took a large number of English patients uh, who are diabetics and uh, uh, looked at them. Uh, they, they tried something else, but the good thing about the trial is that their chances of developing recurrence of events was very, very low. So, the principal investigator of the trial, incidentally, it is a lady who said that if you keep your blood pressure under control, if you keep your blood sugars under control, you keep your cholesterol under control and do not smoke, a patient of diabetes today, in today's world with our knowledge as on today, uh, if they follow their medications and advice correctly, uh, they are much better off than the diabetic patients 10 or 15 years back. So, that is good news for all these patients. Okay. Uh, so, doctor, the next question is, how can one improve outcomes of PCI in patients with diabetes? Improve the outcomes of PCI. Yeah, this is uh, true for non-diabetics as well as diabetics. To improve the outcomes, you know, uh, the most important thing is the procedure itself. You know, when you are inside the cath lab, when you are doing the procedure, utmost care is required for every patient and diabetic or non-diabetic implantation of a correct technique of doing angioplasty is extremely crucial. And once the procedure, uh, once the patient leaves the cath lab and is on his own, then the onus is on the patient to take the drugs co correctly. As I mentioned just for the last question, he needs to look after himself very well. The most important is to take all the evidence based medic medications. The two important medicines of course are the so called dual antiplatelet therapy. There are so many issues in that how long you will give dual antiplatelet therapy, which ones to give and so on and so forth. But by and large most importantly initially dual antiplatelet therapy is an absolute must. And in the dual antiplatelet therapy aspirin is always there and one of these two drugs either ticagrelor or prosugrel is there. How long you have to take your dual antiplatelet therapy that is to be decided by your physician that is another matter but dual antiplatelet therapy and then taking a pantoprazole or isomeprazole like drug is also a very essential thing so that you know uh, he does not uh, have the risk of upper GI bleed and then of course AC inhibitors AR, or ARBs beta blockers very importantly statins statins starting even pre prior to PCI and then continue in high doses. So, uh, these are all the important things and in addition the patient has to keep his blood sugar under control. So, that is also a very important uh, aspect of uh, therapy. Okay. Uh, so, doctor my last question to you is being an interventional cardiologist for so long, can you share any challenging case that you remember? Well, every day is a day of challenge in interventional cardiology, every day. If you want me to recollect right now we have a patient uh, in the hospital. Uh, he uh, came for angioplasty, but then we found that his hemoglobin was very low. And then I said, uh, uh, get an endoscopy done for him because he is a prone to, he, he was an alcoholic and he was a heavy smoker. So, the endoscopy showed 
six ulcers in the esophagus and the stomach from where he was bleeding. So we said we have to postpone his angioplasty. We put him on sucralfate, we put him on high doses of esomeprazole, left him alone for one week, repeated the endoscopy, by which time the gastroenterologist said the ulcers are healing. So this patient, we did not give him aspirin. We gave him only ticagrelor and of course silostrozol. Evidence is relatively lacking, but silostrozol is also a good antiplatelet therapy. And we, under the control of a non-aspirin containing uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, we performed his angioplasty and he did very well. Okay. Yeah. This is only the second patient in my entire career of uh, 25 plus years that we did angioplasty without aspirin. Okay. Yeah. Oh. All right. Thank you so much, doctor, for the interview. It was a pleasure having you Thank here. You.